So this reading is basically about it's basically about the origin of injustice. And by the origin of injustice, I don't mean uh, like what makes people be unjust, but what makes there be any such thing as injustice? Right? Like as we might say, since when is injustice even a thing? Um, so um, and basically in these chapters, Hobbes sets up the fact, according to him, that a commonwealth a state a political society is going to be needed for there to be such a thing as injustice. Um, he doesn't explain how it will be possible to have one. That's going to be the reading for next week, right? So this, this thing is basically just showing that we want um, whether we should want a commonwealth. Well, if we want there to be any such thing as injustice, which as we'll see, according to Hobbes, we definitely do. Um, so there's two parts to that explanation. Um, so the first part is about the right of nature. And right, so right, Hobbes takes to be equivalent to the Latin term use. So you can see that use in here. And so what Hobbes says about the right of nature is going to boil down to it's unlimited. There's unlimited right or use. And therefore, there's nothing that's a violation of right. You can't do anything you don't have a right to do. So there's no injustice. That's the right of nature. And then the second part is about what Hobbes calls the laws of nature. Now, as he points out, you might think that right of nature and law of nature meant the same thing. And uh, his, some of his predecessors did use them to mean the same thing. But he says, this is completely different. This is what you have a right to do according to nature. This is um, how you ought to want your right to be limited. So it's rules that reason prescribes for creating an artificial distinction between just and unjust, an artificial limit between what people have a right to and what they don't. Um, so he, so in the second part, he's going to explain why reason prescribes laws like this, how it does, and also what the laws are in great detail. Right? There's like 19 of them. <laughs> so. Um, something like that. 17, I don't know. All right, so obviously I'm going to talk about this part first and then this part, unless there are questions before I start. Okay. What does this say? A participant in a press transaction. All right. So, um, So Hobbes defines right or use. This is in chapter 14, section three on page 79. Um, um, Right consisteth in liberty to do or to forbear. Right, right means that you are free to do something or not. So, 
So what does that mean? Well, to understand what that means, you have to understand how he defines liberty. He does that in the preceding paragraph. By liberty is understood, according to the proper signification of the word, the absence of external impediments. So, right, I'm free to do something if there's nothing stopping me from doing it. And I'm free not to do something if there's nothing stopping me from not doing it. So I have a right to do something if there's nothing stopping me from doing it or not doing it. Now, um, if you take that literally, of course, it means that it doesn't matter what artificial things we set up, no one can ever do anything they don't have a right to do. Why? Because if they don't have a right to do it, if they're not free to do it, and if they're not free to do it, that means there's an impediment. <laughs> so they can't do it, right? So, so literally, or as it says here, properly speaking, the time I don't have liberty is when like I'm in chains. So then, you know, I don't have liberty to go farther than the chain lets me go. I don't have a right to go farther than the chain lets me go. Um, so, but of course, uh, that's not going to be the interesting sense of liberty for political purposes. So he doesn't actually make this clear until much later on, until chapter 21, that, um, so I guess I should say, right is liberty to do the forbear. And um, liberty is the absence of impediment. But what he's going to make clear in chapter 21 is that there's a literal or proper sense of liberty. I should say the literal sense of impediment. Literally, can't do it. But there's also um, a less literal sense of liberty in which the impediment that I'm saying is absent is what in chapter 21 he's going to call an artificial chain. Now, what is, I mean, of course, real chains are artificial, right? I mean, they're made by humans. Okay. But what he means by artificial chain is that it's not really a chain. It's um, it consists in a reliable threat of retribution. If I do this thing, I can rely on being punished. Um, so I can do it, but um, I guess I shouldn't want to do it. That is, I won't want to do it if I'm rational and I foresee all the consequences. So nothing physically is stopping me from doing it. There isn't like a wall or a chain in my way, but I know that if I do this, I'll be punished. And so uh, if I think about it, I'll decide not to do it. So this kind of artificial chain, remember this is the same thing that he said when he was comparing the commonwealth to a, an animal. And he said that the rewards and punishments are like nerves that make the parts move, right? So that's, that, that's the thing that here he's calling artificial chains. They restrain me from moving in certain ways and they allow me to move in other ways. Um, or in some cases, they, they force me to move in some way, right? But whether I'm forced to move or not to move, that means I don't have the liberty both to do or forbear. <laughs> and so there's a limit to my right.
So it's this non-literal sense of impediment and therefore this non-literal sense of liberty that's gonna be useful in defining right. I have a right to do something if um, um, there's no reliable threat of punishment that will keep me from doing it or not. I can barely hear this motherfucker. Yeah, I have a, well, I had a class for now, but then my car, I didn't get a ticket on it, surprisingly. But I, Ernie, you are unmuted. Should mute all, but. Mute all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> My fault. I should have muted all. All right. Um, so, uh, and the basic thesis is that in a state of nature, so a state of nature, when you talk about the right of nature and the law of nature, state of nature is the state that people are in or would be in if there were no common or when there is no common law. The thesis is that in a state of nature, uh, no one has a greater right than anyone else. So, I mean, what he actually says is no man has a greater right than anyone else. Um, but apparently this applies to both men and women. As we're gonna hear later, this is in chapter 20, paragraph four. It says, um, um, And whereas some have a, so in this case, in, in chapter 20 here, he's talking about which parent will have dominion over the family. And he says, and whereas some have attributed the dominion to the man only as being of the more excellent sex, they misreckon it. For there is not always that difference of strength or prudence between the man and the woman as the right can be determined without war. So it seems that this applies to both men and women. And what applies, what, what applies to both of them is, again, that no one has a greater right than anyone else. Um, so why is it? Well, I mean, of course, people are naturally unequal, right? Like some are stronger, some are weaker. And he admits, although he thinks it's a lot less than we usually think it is, maybe some are smarter. Than others too, right? He says, for the most part, it's our vanity that makes us think we think we're smarter than everyone else. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but what he says is that those natural inequalities are not great enough to be relied on, right? As he puts it, even the weakest is is strong enough to kill the strongest, either by cunning or by teaming up with others to get. So no one can be sure that they're strong enough in the state of nature. No one can be sure that they're strong enough to um, enforce their claim against anyone else. And that means there's no artificial chain, right? Anything that I want to do, there's no reliable punishment that's going to come to me if I do it. We'll only know if we actually have a fight and one of us wins. Um, he does make one exception. This is paragraph, chapter 13, paragraph 2 on page 74. Right? So he says this is true of physical strength. For as to strength of body, the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others that are in the same danger with himself. And then paragraph two, and as to the faculties of the mind, 
setting aside the arts grounded upon words, and especially that skill of proceeding upon general and infallible rules called science, which very few have, and but in few things, as being not a native faculty born with us, nor attained as prudence while we look after somewhat else, I find yet a greater equality among them than a strength. Right, so the main sentence is, as the faculties of mind, I find yet a greater equality among men than that of strength. As, and as I said, he goes on to say, you may think that sounds strange, but that's because you probably think that you're smarter than everyone else. <laughs> and he says, everyone thinks that, which is a sign that everyone probably has pretty much as much intelligence as they want. <laughs> okay. So it's probably evenly distributed. So, um, but he does in parentheses say setting aside. So what he's setting aside is what he calls science, the art of reasoning from definition to learn certain conditional truths. That of course is the thing that Hobbes thinks that he has, although as he says, it's very rare. <laughs> so, um, so that is an exception. Maybe that's worth keeping in mind, but um, he doesn't do anything with it here. So going back to, the, to everything else, I mean, you might say, well, but in the state of nature, you can't, you wouldn't be able to acquire science. I think that's the first thing we would say, but it may be more complicated than that. Anyway, so in the state of nature, again, no one is so strong and prudent that um, they can be sure that they'll be able to win in a fight over anything. And no one is so weak and imprudent that they'll be sure of losing in fight. And you might say, well, why does that mean everyone has a right to, to everything? Well, because if you might not think that if you didn't pay attention to his definitions, <laughs> right? But when you pay attention to his definitions, you'll see that's what it means. If I'm not sure that, so first of all, I'm not literally in chains, right? So, I mean, if I want that, what do we want in the state of nature? Actually, that's a good question. But let's say I want that acorn over there because I need to keep acorns turn up a lot in lots of these cells. I don't think acorns are really good to eat without a lot of processing. Anyway, <laughs> do that as a may. So I want that acorn over there to, to eat it. Um, there's no wall in my way, There's, I'm not in chains. So literally, I definitely have liberty to do or forbear. I can take it or not. All right, what about this non-literal sense though? Well, um, you know, I can't, I can't reckon with anyone else being able to prevent me from taking it. They might or they might not, we'll have to have a fight to find out. Therefore, in this non-literal sense also, nothing's stopping me from taking it. And if nothing's stopping me from taking it, I'm at liberty to take it. And of course, nothing's stopping me from not taking it. Therefore, I'm at liberty to do or forbear, and therefore I have the right. And that applies to everything. So as he says, everyone has a right to everything, including each other's bodies. Right? There's no limit to anyone. Whatever they think conduces to their um, preservation or whatever, but there's no uh, judge other than them, right? That is, whatever they think in their judgments is best for them to do, um, they have a right to do it. Um, and so that's why, as I said, there is justice in the state of nature. And again, right is the same as use. There is justice. There's too much justice. Anything I do is just. The problem is that there's no injustice. <laughs> I can't do anything that's unjust. And therefore, because there's no injustice, there's no property. Why say that? Well, um, property means 
there's something I have a right to that everyone else doesn't also have the same right to. It's proper to me. And um, like all our authors are gonna, it's actually kind of tricky. All of our authors are gonna equivocate on this a little bit. But at least strictly speaking, they use this word property to include not just material objects that I have a right to keep other people from taking or whatever, but if anything, more importantly, things I have a right to do that no one has a right to stop me from doing. That's what property means. Um, and, you know, like most importantly, like that. I have a right to keep on living and other people don't have a right to kill me for no reason. That also counts as property. And in the state of nature, we don't have that property either. There is no property. Right, so that is, or as Hobbes puts it, he, he says it both ways at first. He, he says there is no property, but then he also says that each no there is no property beyond the, for each person that that he can get for so long as he can keep it. I I, I you know I think um, probably the other way is better to say there is no property. You know, as long even though I have it and I can keep it, I, other people still have a right. So it's really not mine, whatever it is. Yeah. So, like, isn't the thought saying, like, the state of nature, there are no rights to harm you? Because um, people have the right to keep my body and not my own. Um, so, only if they do have the right to do what they will. Yeah, so I, I you know. In a sense, everyone owns everything, but in another in more accurate sense, no one owns anything. <laughs> right? Like if, if owning means that there's something I have a right to that other people don't have the same right to. Right? So like if I own this book, that means like I'm at liberty to use or not use this book in a certain way. And no one else is. So if someone else comes and takes my book. I say, hey, that's my book. <laughs> you can't take that. And they think to themselves, oh, there's a reliable threat of retribution if I take that book. And so it's as if a chain stops that. <laughs> but in the state of nature, I can say that as much as I want, but it's not true. Right? There's nothing's going to keep you from taking this book except me fighting you. <laughs> and I might lose. Because again, Hobbes says in the state of nature that inequalities between people in terms of power, physical and mental ability are not great enough that, that I can ever be sure I'll win that fight. So yeah, so it's not mine. And there's no autonomy. I mean, again, too much of a conscience to throw that term around. But I mean, uh, I mean, because like the literal, so autonomy means self legislation, making laws for yourself. And that will be, that will come up as an issue. So, Hobbes isn't really talking about that. But if autonomy means liberty, right? Well, yes, there's liberty, there's unlimited liberty, but it's not much good. <laughs> um, because it's a liberty to do whatever I want. But with the constant knowledge that other people are going to fight me. And I don't know who's going to win. So, this is the beginning of Hobbes' proof that a state of nature is a state of war. And it's a state of war of all against all. Everyone's at war with everyone else. By war, he means, as he says, that it doesn't mean we're necessarily actually fighting. 
right? There can be a war going on even though there's no battle today. There's a state of war if there's a known disposition to do battle. And in the state of nature, that's always true. And the first reason it's always true is pretty much, I've pretty much already been describing. It's because everyone has these unlimited and therefore conflicting rights. Right, so he says the first cause of war is competition. I want that acorn and you also want that acorn and there's no way to decide who's gonna get it other than fighting over it. So that's, that's an initial cause of war. Now, um, um, that's the initial cause of war, but it's actually, you know, although it is enough to show that we're all, right? There's a known disposition to do battle uh, all the time between everyone and everyone else, because everyone has rights to conflict with everyone else's rights. Um, if it were just this, this war might be kind of low key, right? I mean, like, you know, most of the time when I see an acorn, maybe there's no one else around and I could take it. Or I see someone else want that acorn, so I go, oh, okay. But um, but given that we have this constant um, knowledge that other people might come and take away our rights, there arises a second reason to fight. And this is what Hobbes calls diffidence, meaning like mistrust. Fear because of mistrust, right? So even if there's nothing that, you know, that we both want right now, I have to think ahead. I have to think, well, tomorrow there might be something we both want. Um, so I'm afraid. And how can I cure that? And Hobbes says, the only way I can fix that is by what he calls anticipation, right? So um, anticipation means preemptive attack. I attack you now to make sure that you won't be too strong for me tomorrow. And so even though this is kind of a secondary source, it's actually um, a much more powerful source of the will to do battle because you know, for competition, there's like a limit. There's, there's how much stuff I actually want. And if I've got as much as I actually want, I don't have a reason to fight for anything. But for this, there's no limit to how much power I have. Right? I, I, I'm never sure. I can always use more to be more sure that other people won't be able to attack me. And the only way I can do that is to keep attacking them all the time. Um, now, I mean, we still, I guess, might ask, and I think this is why Hobbes introduces a third source of battle. We still might ask, well, wait, how does this get started, really? Because how much is there to fight about? Like, how much, like, remember, people don't actually have stuff. Right? Like, I mean, as, as we'll see, that's a big reason for our desire to get out of the state of nature, supposedly. So like, I mean, there's no point in um, um, there wouldn't be books, right? Because to make a book, you know, like someone has to build a machine and print the book um, because they think that like they're going to be able to uh, sell the book to me for something else or whatever. But meanwhile, in the state of nature, when they build a machine, everyone from all around is going to come around and just take the machine away. <laughs> right? 
right? Or at least they have to assume that might happen. And so they're never going to build a machine in a hurry. So there won't be machines. And so there won't be books, right? So what will there be? Well, like, <laughs> right? So, um, um, but Hobbes says it doesn't actually take anything important to first start people fighting. And this is where he brings in the third cause that he calls glory. Um, and I think that's why it's important because it's, it shows that there always will be something to fight over. And if there always will be something to fight over, then, um, right, there's always will be some, something that we disagree over that's very important to us. And therefore, there always will be. Um, let's see, I don't know. Does it go by way of this, or it just at least it goes straight to this anyway? And so, since I know that there's always going to be something we're going to fight over, I want to get ready and preemptively attack you today. And the thing that we're going to always fight over is this is in paragraph five of chapter 13 on page 76. Um, or actually, it starts on page 75 at the bottom. For every man looketh that his companion should value him at the same rate he sets upon himself. And upon, upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing, undervaluing, naturally endeavors as far as he dares, which amongst them that have no common power to keep them in quiet is far enough to make them destroy each other, to exhort a greater value from his contemners by damage and from others by the example. Right, so um, everyone wants everyone else to acknowledge them as being as great as they are in their own eyes. Right, everyone wants everyone else to value them at the same rate they set on themselves. Everyone sets a higher rate on themselves than other people do for the most part. So for the most part, they're gonna be disappointed in that desire. Other people are not going to value them at the same rate they set upon themselves. And so uh, they're going to try to force them. And they try to force them to either by literally defeating them in battle. See, <laughs> gotta value me now. <laughs> um, or by setting an example to everyone else, they'll be like, oh yeah, don't mess with that guy, right? And so, um, so for that reason, Hobbes says, it doesn't take anything, just the wrong kind of look or smile or whatever, and already we have a battle for the in the state of nature. So the conclusion is that, um, in the state of nature, there is always a war of all against all, and it's not a cold war, it's a war where there's constant battle. Um, so this war is not a good thing. That is, no one calls it good. That is, no one desires it, <laughs> right? because it exposes everyone. There's actually, I guess, two reasons. Well, we don't desire war. Or at least shouldn't desire war if we're rational. So there's some ambiguity about that in Hobbes. I'm not quite sure I understand. But anyway, why we don't desire war, I, I guess the point is like we don't desire it if we think about what it really is. We don't desire it because um, number one, it exposes everyone to continual fear of, of violent death. And 
cause pretty much take it for granted that that's the worst thing. That's the thing you least desire is a violent death. <laughs> so um, continual fear of violent death is very bad. No one wants to live in continual fear of violent death. And the other is, that, and I was already touching on this before, that we can't have nice things in the state of war. Um, the things that, as Hobbes puts it, this is uh, chapter 13, paragraph 14, the things that, quote, are necessary to commodious living, <laughs> like books, for example. Um, he has a longer list of all the things, but pretty much what they add up to is civilization, right? We can't have agriculture, we can't have architecture, we can't have books, we can't have um, trade, right? We can't have any of these things as long as there's a war of, of everyone against everyone. Um, and uh, it's, Hobbes takes for granted, I think, that life without civilization would be miserable, right? Life has what is, what's called savage. You see this term a lot in this class, savages, right? The savages are people who are not civilized. They don't have those things. So, or at least they don't have some of them anyway. But, uh, uh, but these savages in the state of nature wouldn't have any. Um, so the state of nature conclusion, the famous conclusion, the state of nature was or would be um, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and sharp. That is life in the state of nature would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and, and sharp. Yeah. Um, so does he think that there's um, a kind of like collective consciousness that people like in the state of nature kind of come to realize that that like this, the state of nature itself isn't beneficial? Well, I mean, in a way that's a good question. Cause I just, I feel like if someone comes up with the idea to have a society or something and they're still in the state, state of nature, wouldn't someone kill that person to like claim that idea as their own and then it kind of like, um, yeah, so like I said, it's, he's, he's going to talk more about how it's possible to do this next time, but um, but it's, uh, okay, there's two things to say about that. One is that Rousseau is going to go look at things from the point of view you're suggesting and say that, look, how would they even think of this? How would they even come up with this idea? They don't have the concepts they need. Um, thinking of a state of nature as like something that actually happened a long, long time ago, ever before society was invented. So, I mean, like Hobbes sometimes seems to think of it that way, but it's not technically defined that way. And I guess what I was about to, the, the next question I was about to ask that Hobbes asks is, was there ever a state of nature? And he says, that he doesn't think that there was ever a state of nature generally everywhere. Well, he, he, he's not sure, but he thinks, it sounds like he's not sure, but he thinks there probably never was a state of nature generally everywhere. Um, but he says, number one, a lot of people are in the state of nature now. He cites reports of how people live in North America. You know, uh, whether accurate or not, but it's not. <laughs> but in any case, but then he also says, um, sovereigns are always in sta a state of nature with respect to each other, right? Because there is no commonwealth, right? So if there's two commonwealths, each with its sovereign, there's no commonwealth over both of them. And so they're in a state of nature with respect to each other. 
So there is a state of nature right now. Um, now, I mean, obviously this state of nature and Hobbes points this out when he discusses this, this state of nature is a little bit different. So, I mean, again, this is something that comes up in both Hobbes and Locke and they, there isn't really terminology for it, but I guess I could call it like the individual state of nature versus like the, it's still on the screen here. Versus like, I don't know, the international state of nature. So, I mean, these are the same in that uh, there's no, common authority over all the persons involved. But they're different in certain other ways. So one important way they're different is that since these commonwealths are strong enough to protect their citizens, um, well, I don't know which to pick first. Actually, so one way they're different is that these commonwealths may be clearly strong enough to defend themselves against all comers. Whereas individuals in the state of nature are not, according to that. And number two, because they're strong enough to protect their citizens against outside interference, therefore their citizens individually are not exposed to a constant fear of violent death, and they are able to build a civilization. Um, but what if there's some people in the state of nature. Well, now one of these commonwealths can come and conquer them. That's a way they could lose the state of nature. <laughs> this is called commonwealth by acquisition. And I'm gonna talk about it more in a second. So in other words, it's not clear that Hobbes, although Hobbes um, doesn't think the state of nature is like a fairy tale, um, it's not clear he thinks of a historical stage that everyone was in, and then they like um, somehow found a way out of it. He is going to describe how that would be possible to do, but it's not even clear that he ever thinks that actually. <laughs> so, yeah. So I guess, like in the state of nature, you can't say like nobody really like well, I mean, you can't, like, as an individual, you can't just rebel against it, right? In other words, I can say, as an individual, I can say, well, I'm going to respect other people's property. And what that means in the state of nature is that, like, I'm restraining myself from doing things that no one else is restraining themselves from doing. So as Hobbes says, I'm just making myself prey to everyone else. Right, so I can't unilaterally act in the state of nature. But I, I was, I'm about to talk about how, so yeah, I kind of, I don't know, got ahead of myself, but that's okay, I took questions before, but that, you know, so Hobbes is gonna talk about how to get out of the state of nature. Well, let me just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain as I go along. So, um, right, so these, right, these passions, this is aversion, this is an aversion, and this is a desire. Everyone has these passions, according to Hobbes. In the state of nature, everyone is doesn't like to be in fear of violent death, and everyone wants to be able to have civilization. Um, and so there's one thing they all can agree to call good, as I mentioned. Before and one thing they can all seem to need to call evil. And the one thing they can all agree to call good is peace. Right? So this is chapter 15, 
paragraph 40 on page 100. Um, and therefore, so long as a man is in the condition of mere nature, which is a condition of war, as private appetite is the measure of good and evil, and consequently all men agree on this, that peace is good, and therefore also the way or means of peace. Um, and therefore also the way or means of peace are good. That is to say, moral virtues and their contrary vices evil. Right, so in the state of nature, everyone can agree that war is bad, and peace is good, and therefore the whatever conduces to peace is good, and whatever conduces to war is evil. And remember, I say everyone can agree. So, like, remember, I mean, in the other cases, we don't exactly disagree about what's good and what's evil. We just kind of non-agree, right? Like I say, for me to get that acorn is good, and you say, for me to get that acorn is good. <laughs> And I say, no, for me to get that acorn is good, so for you to get it is evil. And you say, no, for me to get it is good, so for you to get it is evil. But we're not contradicting each other, right? Because when I say it's good, I mean, I desire it. And you say it's good, you mean you do desire it. Um, so um, the issue is not that we disagree with each other, but that we have these um, disconnected definitions of good and evil that can't be used um to collectively decide what to do but there's this one exception because the state of nature is a state of war against, of all against all and that's something none of us want and we all desire something else instead there's one thing where when i say it's good you're going to say oh yeah that's good right so i say like or in the state of nature say peace would be good and you say yes peace would be good so we agree. Now, so peace is, so to speak, absolutely good. That is, remember, absolute is the opposite of relative. Peace is absolutely good, meaning we don't have to say relative to who. When I say peace is good, I don't have to say good for who. Everyone desires it. So that's what it allows there to be a science of morality put in place. Like what um, ways of acting or um, dispositions to act are good and which and what are evil in an absolute sense. The question boils down to do they lead to peace or war? If they lead to peace, they're good in an absolute sense. Which, of course, like, it doesn't automatically mean that everyone desires them more than everything else. Um, but since this is very, very bad, <laughs> I think it's going to be Hobbes' contention that not only can we all agree on them, but we can all agree that what's good in an absolute sense is the most important thing, the best. The thing that we all desire. Okay, does, does that make sense? Is that question about that? Yes. Can men say what desire to be Well, desire for when desires that compete or conflict with each other lead to war. But the desire for peace does not, right? That's what, again, like it's not something we all want in the sense that we all want water. And that was my example before. We all want water means I want water for me, and you want water for you. But, we all, but, but it doesn't make sense for me to say I want peace for me and not everyone else. Right? The state of peace is a state that we all have to be in for there to be peace. So if there's one thing that we all want. Um, and we want and we really want it because 
Um, we really don't like violent deaths, and we really would like to be able to have all these nice things. We don't have. We're miserable in the state of nature. And if we're not in the state of nature, well, if we think about it and realize what the state of, state of nature would be like, which Hobbes is trying to get us to focus on together, we'll know that we don't want to be back in the state of nature. <laughs> right? So one way or the other, we should all be able to agree that what we want is peace. Um, so, um, so it's from this universal desire for peace that Hobbes deduces what he calls the laws of nature. So the laws of nature, as he says, this is chapter 13, paragraph 14, on page 78. Um, reason suggests us convenient articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. These articles are they which otherwise are called the law, laws of nature. Right? So the laws of nature are, so everyone wants peace. So reason suggests means, of course, like, this is a metaphorical way of talking, which Pop says is automatically deceptive, but he does it all the time. <laughs> um, in, in the very context where he says it's deceptive, he does it right so so reason suggests just means if you think about it you'll realize right reason isn't a person you know so reason suggests convenient articles of peace means if you think about it you'll realize that these are the things that will have to be these are the rules that people will have to follow if they're human beings So they're not exactly really laws, as Hobbes eventually says. He only says this explicitly after he's done listing all the laws. He says, oh, and by the way, although people call these laws, they're not really laws. They're theorems of reason. Ray, what, why are they not really laws? Well, um, they don't command you to do something. Um, they presuppose that you want something and they tell you how to get it, right? If you want peace, do X, Y, and Z. So that's not a law, that's what Hobbes calls counsel, that's like advice. This doesn't have to be anyone enforcing. I mean, I'm free not to do it if I don't want peace. Only everyone does want peace, so I should want to do it, right? as opposed to a law, which is someone commanding me to do something, and I should do it because they want me to do it. And I want to do what they want me to do because otherwise they're going to punish me. That's a law. <laughs> this is advice or counsel. So they're not laws, exactly. And also, um, and you know, this is a little bit hard to understand. I know from experience, it's a little bit hard to understand, but it, I think it's pretty important. Um, not only are not laws, but they also, in a state of nature, they don't actually command you to do anything. <laughs> They're in effect, but they don't command you to do anything. So Hobbes expresses it, this using this technical Latin terminology. This is um, chapter 15, paragraph 36 on page 99. The laws of nature oblige in foro interno. Right, so you know what a forum is, right? Like, well, I mean, I guess technically it's like the central like square of a Roman city, right? <laughs> but um, it's, uh, uh, but that's where they used to like judge law cases, you know, so it's like we're talking about a kind of court. And the tablet is this foro. So it's in foro. In 
Paterno means in the internal court, in the internal forum. What, so what does that mean? They, so the law of nature obliged in quarrel in Terno, that is to say, they bind to a desire they should take place. But in foro externo, that is, to the putting them in act, not always. Why don't they always bind to the putting them in act? This is the same thing I was saying about the question, can someone rebel against them? For he that should be modest and tractable and perform all he promises in such time and place where no man else should do so, should but make himself a prey to others and procure his own certain ruin, contrary to the ground of all laws of nature, which tend to nature's preservation. Right, so the laws of nature tell you what to do to get peace because peace is what will tend to your preservation. Um, so they don't tell you to do anything in the case, they don't tell you to do anything that will lead to your destruction. So to, to actually act on any of these laws in a state of nature would lead to your destruction. So in a state of nature, they don't come in to act. So what do they command you to do? Will they command you to desire that people should act on these laws? So it's like, remember, a desire is a small internal motion that, if it's not counteracted by other motions, can be amplified into a big motion of the will. But in a state of nature, Hobbes is saying, the laws of nature only command this small internal motion. And what does it mean to say they command it? Because again, they don't really command, they really advise it. It really means in a state of nature, if you know what's good for you, you should want these laws to be interpreted. Right? Reason suggests that you should want. So it means that, you know, this little internal motion will start if you're rational, but it won't go any farther than that. So the laws of nature always are always in effect. They're immutable, Hobbes says, but in a state of nature, they don't actually command you to do anything. And it's really because as an individual in a state of nature, it's, it's not so much because it's not like I desire, you know, to eat that cake, but I know it's bad for me. So another desire like counteracts this one. It's, it's, it's more like I desire to eat that cake, but I realize it's impossible. <laughs> and so the desire stops there, right? Because in a state of nature, there's nothing I as an individual can do to make these laws be observed. So all I do is go around wishing they were okay. So like I said, next time we're going to talk more about how it could happen that they that start that they start being observed. But um, for now, I'm going to talk more about what the laws of nature are and how they're related to each other. Now, I'm not gonna talk about all 17 or 19 or however many there are, um, just because there isn't time, although basically all of them are interesting. Um, but I'm gonna talk at least about the first three, I hope, and maybe also about the 13th, a little bit. So, um, and the 10th maybe, I hope. So the first law of nature, So Hobbes says the first law of nature is seek peace. Now, um, or actually he says, seek peace and follow. That's a quote from Psalm 34. But I, anyway, it says, 
seek peace and follow it. That's the first law. So it's the first and fundamental law, he says. Why is it fundamental? Well, it basically all it does is state the motive for all the other stuff. Right. So in a state, so what I should always <coughs> I should always want everyone to seek peace. And the second law then gives the condition. So all the so all the other laws are then you know going to be the things I should want people to do because they're seeking peace. The things you should do if you're seeking peace. That's again why I say this is a, it's 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 not really on the same level as the other law. There are, all the other laws are derived from. Um, so, um, um, but the second law also has a special status with respect to all the ones that come after it. Because the second law states the condition under which any of the other laws would actually be observed, right? So I want all the laws to be observed because I want peace. And the second law says, well, if you want any of these laws to be observed, which you should because you want peace, if you want any of these other laws to be observed, this is what you should desire. And what you desire is that um, everyone mutually lay down some of their rights. Or can we read it from this is chapter 14, paragraph 5 on page 80. From this fundamental law of nature, that is the first law, by which men are commanded to endeavor peace, is derived this second law that a man be willing, when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and defense of himself he shall think it necessary. To lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. That's the full statement of it. Right? So that is what I want is for everyone to, including me, to give up some of their rights in. Uh, exchange for other people giving up the same rights. I mean, we can only give up rights starting in the state of nature, right? Because starting in the state of nature, we all had an unlimited right to everything. We can't get any more rights. But if we're going to move out of the state of nature, we have to give up some of our rights. And the condition that the second law states is. The only way that's going to happen is if we mutually lay down rights. Now, I mean, what does it mean to lay down rights? That's another metaphor, right? It doesn't make any more sense, really, than the things that Hobbes talked about, like infused faith or something like that. They, our faith is poured into you. <laughs> so a right isn't literally something you can lay down. But, um, but from the definition of right that I had written up before, you can see that what this must mean is that we somehow are able to set up artificial chains that restrain each of us with respect to the other. Yeah. So we're also giving up, like, basically giving up our liberty. Yes. So, right. So, according to Hobbes, and this is going to be important because we'll see that um, uh, Locke and Rousseau disagree with this. But yes, according to Hobbes, um, when you leave the state of nature you and you give up certain rights, you give up some of your liberty and you have less liberty. Before you were free to do or forbear or whatever you want to do, now there's going to be artificial change. Um, 
um, so I should point out right away. Um, I guess I guess I kind of already pointed this out because, as I said, I got ahead of myself. That um, besides this, there could be another way of following the person. So. Um, Suppose I'm powerful enough to impose these on everyone else. So I just say, okay, now there's going to be peace. If I can do that, then I can then I can observe the first law without requiring this mutual laying down. Um, now. The thing about humans being equal in a state of nature means that in a state of nature, according to Hobbes, no one can do this. Right? There's no one is strong enough to like tell everyone else, okay, stop fighting and do what I say. <laughs> um, but in that international state of nature, someone could be strong enough to do this. Someone meaning a common. And so after Hobbes' whole discussion of how we set up a commonwealth this way by mutually laying down rights and how that works, et cetera, et cetera, he's gonna say, oh, but there's also commonwealth by acquisition. And commonwealth by acquisition means that, um, um, yeah, someone strong comes and conquers everyone and the someone strong has to be an existing commonwealth again, right? Because in the state of nature, no one is strong enough to do this. But someone in the individual state of nature, no one is strong enough to do this, right? So that so the someone strong comes along and conquers a whole bunch of people and says, um, all right, uh, you no longer have the right to everything. I'm telling you, you have the right to everything. <laughs> and that's another way that a commonwealth can originate. And this also explains um, something that Locke is going to have a lot of trouble with. Why is each new generation that's born into an existing commonwealth um, like subject to it? <coughs> These people who were born later have not laid down any of their rights. I think it was the people who were around when the Commonwealth was created agreed to lay down their rights somehow. We don't know exactly how it's going to work, right? But somehow they've agreed to, they've, they've figured out how to set up these artificial chains that are going to keep each of them in their own sphere. Um, but what about the people who come, you know, their descendants? They never agreed to lay down their rights. So Hobbes says, I mean, he doesn't say this explicitly, I think, but I think he implies this. They're conquered when they're born. Right? Like they find themselves in the presence of this very strong individual, the existing conflict, which says to them, you obey these laws or else. <laughs> um, okay. So that kind of, um, exception, but Hobbes is going to argue that the uh, sovereign of a commonwealth by acquisition has exactly the same rights and powers as a sovereign of a common, of, um, a commonwealth by, yeah, by acquisition. I don't say by covenant, but I don't think that's the term used. Anyway, by institution, I think is what he calls it. Right? So the sovereign of a commonwealth by acquisition has exactly the same rights and powers as the sovereign of a commonwealth by institution. And, then, and so he's going to like actually, when, when, he, when he gets to talk about commonwealth by acquisition, he doesn't spend very much time on it. But he says, you know, all those things I proved about the people who formed the commonwealth this way, well, they all apply to the commonwealth by acquisition. So um, I hope it's clear why it's important to keep that possibility in mind. Because it's, I mean, I mean, it turns out, even though Hobbes treats it kind of like an exception, 
but it's actually like the way people normally become involved in a comic, right? By being born into it. And they don't have a choice to lay down their life. In that. <laughs> They're told what to do. Okay, anyway. Um, but the, the, this law of nature, and at least the way Hobbes is thinking here about the other laws of nature, all presume a different situation. We're all in the state of nature, we're all equal, and somehow we found a way to mutually lay down our rights. So the mutual transfer of rights that this law requires is, first of all, by definition, what Hobbes calls a contract. This is the definition of contract. Um, chapter 14, paragraph 9 on page 82. The mutual transferring of right is that which men call contract. Right? So by definition, if we're mutually transferring rights to each other, we're making a contract. Moreover, in this part, I know, again, by experience, it's hard to understand. So please ask questions at this point. But this contract is a kind of contract that Hobbes called a covenant. Sometimes he also calls it a pact. This is like a civil law term, I think. Um, the covenant is a contract. So in a contract, we transfer, we mutually transfer rights. So like a simple case of a contract would be that I'm selling you a piece of land. So you, like, um, I transfer the right to this land to you, and you transfer the right to the money to me. That's a contract. But, um, but then there's two different ways we could do that. We could transfer the actual goods at the same time, maybe rather than land, I should do something new with it, the cow, <laughs> you know, right? We could transfer the actual goods at the same time we transfer the rights. So I say, this is your cow now, <laughs> right? And you say, okay, here's your money. And we've transferred the rights. And we've also transferred the actual thing. But on the other hand, we could set it up so that we transfer the rights now, but the goods are actually going to be transferred later. One or both of them are going to be transferred later. Right? So, you know, you give me the money and I say I'm going to deliver the cow tomorrow. I'm giving you the right to the cow now, but I'm not going to give you a cow until tomorrow. It's still in my barn. If that's what Hobbes calls a covenant. So a covenant is a kind of contract, but it's a contract where um, <coughs> the rights are transferred. So in any contract, the rights have to be transferred immediately. Otherwise, it's not a contract. Um, there has to be a mutual transfer of rights immediately. Right? Like, for example, if I say Hobbes discusses these cases, I think this is based on civil and common law, case law, you know, it's, Stuff. But, you know, he discusses these cases like if I say, um, I will give you a cow tomorrow, there's no contract because I haven't given you any right now. So the cow is still mine. The cow is still mine. I have the right to it. And that means I have a right to give it to you tomorrow or not. <laughs> but if I say, um, I give you the cow now to be delivered tomorrow, there's a contract. Because I, you have the right to it immediately. So there's always an immediate transfer of rights, but there could be a delay in the transfer of the goods, and that's what makes it a covenant. Now, this contract that creates the commonwealth is one where, of course, as usual, the rights are all transferred immediately once at the beginning. Right? I lay down some of my rights, and you lay down some of your rights, and we're done. But the goods are going to have to be keep being delivered forever. 
right? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna have to keep not exercising my unlimited right of nature. Every time that comes up, I'm so to speak delivering part of the cow. Right? So like tomorrow we're walking through a forest and um and I see an acorn and you say, oh no, that's my acorn. Here's my deed to the acorn. <laughs> um, so now I have to not take the acorn. Not taking the acorn is like delivering the cow. Right, I already laid down my right to the acorn, transferred it to you in this case. Right, because somehow the civil laws have made this acorn yours. But never mind exactly how that works, but I transferred my right, which I had, my right of nature to the acorn. I transferred it to you yesterday when we made the compact. I have no right to it anymore, but I can still take it. Just like, you know, if you have the right to the cow now, but I can still keep it and not deliver. So this has to keep going on as long as the Commonwealth exists. Every time there's something I want, but now I don't have a right to because I laid down my right to reform the Commonwealth, I have to deliver on my promise. So, and that's why it's a covenant. So the Commonwealth is formed by everyone who's going to be part of the Commonwealth. So this is unanimous. Um, certain other things are going to happen in the formation of the Commonwealth that are going to go by majority vote, according to how. But this step is unanimous. It's unanimous by definition. That is, everyone who doesn't enter this common covenant is not part of the commonwealth. So all the people who are going to be part of the commonwealth enter this co covenant at the same time, and it's a completely symmetrical common covenant. Everyone lays down the same rights. Um, Hobbes actually proves that under the 10th law, chapter 15, paragraph 22. I'm not going to read that, but he proves that um, basically the reasoning works like this, that, that you know, the law before that says that everyone, in order to seek peace, everyone has to acknowledge everyone else as their equal. And therefore, if we're mutually laying down rights, the only way I can acknowledge everyone else as my equal is to lay down exactly the same rights as they do. So it's going to be a completely symmetrical con contract between each member of the Commonwealth that's coming into existence and each other member. So it's like symmetrical and multi-way covenant. Everyone is making these promises back and forth. Um, now, if you ask, this is why I wanted to mention the 13th law. So, so right, what this means is that well, in the state of nature, everyone had identical rights. Everyone had a limited right to everything. But when we pass into the Commonwealth, Bob says, it's still true, everyone has the same rights. So if later on, under civil government, people end up unequal. Now, because remember, like, if I own two books and everyone else only owns one book, that means I have more rights. Property is a right. I have the right to the unmolested use of these two books where everyone else only has a right to the unmolested use of one book. Right, so any kind of inequality, inequality in property, inequality in rank, um, 
rank is not something, well, at least not explicitly that we keep track of in our society, right? But it's it always it's always weighing on the mind of these people. Like, are you are you commoner or are you nobility? Nobility. Hey, so um, inequality of property, inequality of rank, etc. Any kind of privileges that some people have over others. And privilege literally means private law, like a law that is specific to me. <laughs> In the Roman Empire, it was like the, if the emperor made a law that was just for one person, that was called a privilege. <laughs> Right, so um, inequality and in privileges and property and rank, all those things, those are all inequalities and rights. How did that come about? Since at the beginning, we were supposed to all end up with the same rights. So um, apparently it can be traced to the thirteenth law. So this is um, chapter 15, Paragraph 26 on page 97 at the bottom. But before that, he said that things that can't be divided have to be enjoyed. So actually before that, he said that therefore at the formation of the Commonwealth, things that can be divided have to be shared out equally. And things that can't be divided should be enjoyed in common if possible. But then, and this is the beginning of paragraph 26, but some things there be that can neither be divided nor enjoyed in common. Then the law of nature, which prescribeth equity, requireth that the entire right, parentheses, or else making the use alternate, the first possession. So that's interesting. And we don't really see people doing this very often, but he's pointing out that if there's something that we can't all share and we can't divide up. We could take turns at it. <laughs> but even then, there's a question of who's going to get it first, right? So the entire right, or else making the use alternate, the first possession, be determined by lot. For equal distribution is of the law of nature, and other means of equal distribution cannot be imagined. Right? So by lot means, you know, like it sounds like he means, okay, throw, you know, throw dice or like do any meeny might. E mini mini mo is really not random, but <laughs> as, as all children know. Uh, but you know, throw a dice, flip a coin, whatever. But if you read the following paragraphs, it turns out that that's not exactly what he means by distributed by lot. He means he says there's two ways of distributing by lot. One is um, first seizure, right? So like. The first, whoever gets it first, it's going to belong to them. That's like deciding by lot. <laughs> right? So, I, you know, so land is something he has in mind here. I mean, land, of course, can be divided, but I guess it's not useful in very small pieces, or I'm not sure exactly. I think he's thinking of that. He doesn't give any examples. Maybe he's thinking of rank. Anyway, so, but how could there be first seizure of that? Well, in any case, so because, so one way of distributing things by lot is the first one to get it, it's gonna be theirs. And another way of distributing by lot is the firstborn will get it, primogeniture. So I, that explains why, when, how and why, when you set up the Commonwealth initially, it might turn out that everyone doesn't have exactly the same rights. I mean, we've made an agreement to like lay down the same rights, but then it turns out there's certain things that are gonna have to go to one person rather than another. And those are gonna be decided in this other way. And so there's gonna be some inequality to start out with. And a little bit of inequality tends to grow. Um, See Rousseau especially emphasizing that, but I think all of these people agree on that, and it stands to reason, right? Because the people who have a little bit more have a head start. Um, 
Okay. So anyway, um, so that's that's pretty much the discussion of the second law for now. Are there questions about that? I guess there's one other thing to say about it, which is okay. What about Commonwealth by acquisition or conquest? So what he says about that in chapter 21, which we haven't got to yet. So this is chapter 21, paragraph 11. Sovereignty by institution is by, sorry, did I say it's on page 141? Sovereignty by, by institution is by covenant of everyone to everyone, and sovereignty by acquisition by covenants of the vanquished to the victor or child to the parent. Right, so sovereignty, so this like symmetrical relationship of covenants between everyone and everyone else is commonwealth by acquisition, by mutual laying down of rights. A commonwealth by acquisition, that is by conquest, it's a covenant between the victor and it's an individual covenant between each of the vanquished and the victor. And moreover, it's really only a covenant in one direction because what happens is the victor says, okay, if you agree to be part of my commonwealth, I won't kill you. <laughs> and the victor delivers the goods immediately by not killing you. So there's no covenant on that side. But every individual now has to behave as a member of the commonwealth. So they have to keep delivering the goods in that sense of the covenant. All right, so, so either way, actually, the point is that um, the seeking peace, if we desire peace, we desire that a certain covenant should be made. But of course, it's only desirable that a certain covenant should be made if people are going to keep the covenant. Right? Like the point of desiring. So, you know, I mean, we can make a covenant that I'm going to, you're going to pay me now and I'm going to deliver the cow tomorrow. Um, and that might be desirable if you want a cow, but only if you think I'm actually going to deliver the cow. If I don't, that would be a bad deal, right? So, um, so in order for this covenant to be to be useful as a means to peace, it has to be the case that people are going to follow it, and that's where we get to the third law. That's still visible. Um, that men perform their covenants made. Right, so the third law is and again in the state of nature, this means just that I should desire this. I should desire that people keep covenant. I should desire that people people keep covenants because I should desire there to be this covenant, and again, it's only useful if people are keeping it. So I should desire that there be this covenant and that people keep it. And I desire that there be a covenant because I desire peace. So I desire that people should keep their covenants. And then, of course, and then, so again, this has a special status with respect to these first three laws, all have a special status with respect to all the others because. The others are all the articles of peace that we're now going to agree to to form a commonwealth. Um, but none of them will have any actual effect if the third law isn't observed. Okay? Because they're all the articles of a covenant. So covenants have to be kept. Um,
Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the remaining laws of nature in detail, but um, but I do want to talk about something else, um, which is um, okay. So how exactly does does one lay down a right according to Adam? What do you do to lay down the right? I erase all this stuff. So, um, now, um, well, Hobbes has a general answer to this. He says, um, by giving words or other voluntary signs. The way I lay down my right is by saying, I hereby lay down my right. Um, or by certain action, right? It doesn't have to be words, but it has to be signs that proceed from my will. Why does they have to be signs that proceed from my will? Well, no, so actually Hobbes is gonna see, it's gonna say that um, in a state of nature, rights that you give up through coercion are a contract that's made under duress is valid. A covenant that's made under duress is valid. Because you wanted, you wanted to give up the right. It was voluntary. Right, like in that case of the that I was drawing here, where the contract is like agree to be part of my co my commonwealth, and I won't kill you. <laughs> That's a valid covenant in the state of nature. So, um, and and it and it doesn't it doesn't contradict the idea that these people are doing it voluntarily. So, voluntarily means they're doing it by their will, and they're doing it by their will means. They're doing it by the final desire or aversion of a deliberation, right? And that means that, all, you know, after they foresaw all the consequences they could, they decided that, or they decided, the desire to do it won out. <laughs> so they've done it voluntarily. So yeah, it's not really against coercion, but it, but it's, um, I mean, what I'm getting a little stuck on here is why can't it be kind of inadvertent signs? Like you can, things from which you can conclude that I've laid down my right, even though I'm not necessarily doing it on purpose. I, um, I mean, of course, I can't lay down my right. Isn't that obvious? I can't lay down my right if I don't want to. Um, does that really follow from the definition? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, I've wasted time going back and forth about this. Um, I just want to say, so um, for whatever reason, it has to be words or voluntary signs. That's how we lay down our rights. But you might ask, well, wait, like, how can that create an impediment to me doing something? And Hobbes says, well, it can't. Um, so, uh, 
So Hobbes says these words have their effect not by their own nature, but by the existence of, of by my fear of violating what I've said. I guess I'm gonna have to, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm gonna have to talk about this a little bit. I'll see you then. Oh. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.